Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here, talking about the return of Christ. Now, before we even get started, I'm going to let you know, this is not clickbait. This is a very serious class, and either the Spirit of God led you here, or your curiosity led you here, but either way, don't let your ego or your doubtfulness discourage you and make you click off this video before you understand what I'm telling you. The return of Christ happened on Rosh Hashanah, the first day of the seventh month now like i said this ain't clickbait look down there in the number of people who have left comments look down there at the number of people who have viewed this video look down there at the number of people who have taken the time to rate this video whether they gave it a thumbs up or whether they gave it a thumbs down let you know that this video holds substance. In this video, I'm going to give you biblical and historical proof of the return of Christ and how he returned on Rosh Hashanah. But I'm going to try to do so as concisely as possible. I'm going to try to make this video as short as possible so you guys can get through it. But at the end of this video, I'm going to give you some links to some more detailed videos on this subject, showing you in greater detail how... The Messiah returned on Rosh Hashanah. So look for those towards the end of this video. I'm doing it that way to keep this video as short as possible. Anyway, let's jump right into it. First of all, and for, for us to understand the return of Christ, we have to understand who Christ is. Okay, now understand first of all that Jesus and Christ are not the same being. There are two different individuals. I almost want to say people, but... Jesus was a person. The Christ was God. They merged at his baptism. But I'm sure it's easy for you to understand that those two beings, both man and God, came together at, the, at Christ's baptism. And that's very important to understand because when we're talking about the return of Christ, we're not necessarily talking about Jesus. Jesus, the man figure, the fleshly being, is not what we're talking about. We're talking about the Christ part. We're talking about the God part returning here. And to get an understanding of that, we have to jump over to the book of John and chapter 1 and verse 1. This is what tells us who God is. Before we look at this verse, think about something for a second. If somebody were to come in your house and say, who is God? Point to him. What would you point to? If they said point out God, what would, would you point to a picture on the wall or would you go grab some figurine out of some box somewhere and say, this is God? What would you point to if they said, what does God, what does your God say? Or if, or if they asked, how do you hear from God? What does he sound like? What does he do for you? How does he do it? What would you point to? Right? Well, before we answer that question, let's look at John in chapter 1 and verse 1. It says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. This right here explains to us who God is. God is the word. So when somebody says, point to your God, you should be pointing to your scripture. You should be pointing to your Bible, at least. When they say, what does God sound like? Well, you open up your your scripture there, probably to Exodus chapter 20 uh, and read the book of the covenant to them and say, these are God's words. When they say, how does God do something for you? You point out the promises that are in that book that tell you how when you are obedient to those rules of the covenant, you will get blessings and how he will take care of you both financially, physically, emotionally, uh, just about every Every aspect of our life is provided for by way of our father, but it's through obedience to his word. So when somebody said, who is your God? Our God, like it says here in John chapter one and verse one is the word and God was the word. That should be real easy to understand. So when we're seriously contemplating the idea of the return of Christ, we should be looking for him in the form of the word of God, right? Well, look over here at the book of Revelation chapter 19 for the proof. I'm going to jump all the way down here to verse 13. It says, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name was called the word of God. Now, who are we talking about here? If you look back up there in verse 11, we're talking about 
uh, he who rode the white horse and he sat up on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he does judge and make war. We're talking about the return of Christ. You see right there in verse 12, everybody has heard this verse right here. It says his eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but himself. Everybody's heard that verse a thousand times before, right? Well, who is he talking about? In verse 13, he says, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. So you put these two verses together and John chapter one says that the word is God. And then when you look at verse um, 13 of chapter 19 of the book of Revelation, it said that he will return as the word of God. So that's where we should be looking for him, right? as the return of the word of God. So let's go in. Like I said, I'm going to give you biblical and historical proof of the return of God. So for that, we're going to jump over to the book of Daniel. I hope you're following me here. This is very serious stuff. This right, in fact, is actually the third time that our father has came down to visit us here on the earth. The first time was back there with Moses. They, that's really the first coming back there with Moses when, you know, they he was in the tent of, of meeting. Um, they actually ended up, you know, building what they called the Ark of the Covenant. And, you know, they carried that box around the wilderness for a while. Well, what was in that box amongst the uh, proof? That he was God, that rod that Aaron carried and that manna that the father provided for those people out there. There was the covenant, the same book that we talk about, Exodus chapter 20 through 23 or through 24 verse 7, where it all ends at. That's what was actually in the box. So and my point is, is that during the first coming, he was the word of God. And the Old Testament served as our father for many, many thousands of years because when they wanted to hear from him, where did they go? Did they look up in the sky? Did they pull up, pull up some figurine or did they pull out the word of God to go hear his voice and understand who he is and to see what he looked like? He is the word of God then way back in the Old Testament and even now. When you want to understand who the Father is, you have not only the Old Testament, but you have the New Testament. You can read the books like Gospels, you can read the Gospels, and you can um, read some of the books by Paul to get a greater understanding of what our Father looks like, what He sounds like, what He acts like. That's the only place that you can get that type of information of who God is, is through the Word of God, is my point. But anyway, let me jump over here and show you in, through Daniel's timeline on when Daniel prophesied that the father would return. Now, you see that simply stated right there in verse 14 of chapter 8. Like I said, I want this to be concise as possible. I've done one video. You'll see linked at the end of this video called What Went Wrong in 1844. Okay, so I want you guys to watch that video. It's a much longer video going into greater detail, more proof of what I'm going to show you right here where we went verse by verse and line by line mathematically we even pulled out uh the timeline of human history to prove these points right here but go in and check out that video for more detail but right here what i want to show you really want you to understand really really quickly is that what it's saying right here in in verse 14 of chapter 8 started in the year started in the year 417 bc well let me show you that but first of all let's read this verse it says and he said unto me unto 2300 days then shall the sanctuary be cleansed now some of you guys one of the videos that you you want to might want to check out is called the great disappointment this is where back in the year 1844, those individuals using this calculation right here had went in to make the determination on when the Christ was to, to return. Many people sold their houses. They quit their jobs. They went as far as to burning their money in the street because they was absolutely sure that the Christ would return in 1844. But the thing about it, they made a miscalculation. There was a... Um, 
guy, I can't remember his name, his name right now, but he used, he tried to use this verse right here to determine the, the return of Christ. And thing is, he used the wrong calculation. You see right there in verse 13, where it says the daily sacrifice. Well, let me show you something. Without going into all of the detail, you must understand that that date, that 2,300 year date that was talked about over there in Daniel in chapter 8 was based on a, a decree from the, the king in order to build Jerusalem. But as you look in here in the book of Ezra, you'll see that there were several decrees made, which was the problem that I think his name was Williams made back there in 1844, which he didn't know which king to, to use to start his calculation. Was it supposed to start based on King Cyrus, which was the one who freed the, the Jews? Or was it supposed to be based on Artaxerxes? Or was it supposed to be based on Darius the first or Darius the second? Well, he based his his um, his calculation based on Artaxerxes because I believe that that put it right there in the year that he was living. If he had a chose Cyrus, it would have caused him to be over a hundred years too late and he would have missed the return, so he thought. And if he had a chose Darius the second, he would have been too early by about 40 years that we're going to find out here in a second. But if he had have picked the right time frame, the right start date, and knew exactly what he was looking for, he would have actually saw the return of Christ. See, look right here in Ezra chapter 6 verses 14 and 15. Both of these talk about the finishing of the second temple. You see right there, verse 15, he says, And this house was finished on the third day of the month Adar, which is in the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king. So this was actually should have been his start date. You, you, It should be easy to understand that it, it's not so much of an importance on a king's decree. That's only a person that we're talking about. And you think about it. Would our father change all of the history because of a statement or a decree made? Made by Donald Trump or Putin or Kim Jong-il. These are just people. What's important to our father is the temple and the ceremonies that took place in the temple. And we see that it was during the reign of Darius the king when they actually finished the, the temple and actually started doing the daily sacrifice again. That should have been his start date. And when we look back in history, we see that that time would have actually started in 417 BC. That was the actual start date. I keep referring you to these other videos because I went into greater detail. I think one of those videos took an hour long to prove these points right here that I'm showing you here in just a few moments. But look right here. When we start off in the year 417, of course, that's 417 BC. So we have to add a negative in there. And then we're going to add the timeline given to Daniel, which was 2300 years. Now, remember that we have to add one year because there was no year zero. We end up in the year 1884, not 1844. Like I said, go look at the great disappointment. You can see um, video after video that people are still talking about this 1844 date when they thought that the Messiah would return. Look at those videos because you'll see how big of a deal this is that we're talking about. These people actually depend they based their whole life on this 1844 date when they actually missed it by 40 years because they chose the wrong start date and plus they chose the the wrong outcome too i don't know what they was expecting to happen in 1844 but it was clear that they wasn't looking for the word of god because they sold their houses they they uh, quit their jobs. The scripture doesn't tell them to do that. So what was they actually looking for in 1844? But if they had got the right date correct, they would have been looking in 1884. And what would they have been looking for in 1884? They would have been looking for the word of God. So let me show you how the father, how the Christ returned in 1884. 
Now, to do that, I'm going to jump you over to chapter 2 of some highly suppressed scripture. Some scripture that some of you have never heard of before. Many of you guys who follow our channel have had this, have had classes out of this book for uh, years now. But let me show you right here in verse 5 of chapter 2. It says, Do you remember that cloud in which my disciples saw me ascend? The last time that I manifested myself to them, in truth, it was written that I would come again in a cloud, and this I have fulfilled. On the first day of September 1866, my spirit came in a symbolic cloud to prepare you to receive the new lesson. Later, in 1884, I began to give you my teachings. Guys, within this verse Right here, if you have ears to hear it, you can fully understand that our father, the Christ, returned in 1884. Look at it here. Like I said, go back and look at those at, at, at what happened in 1844 and look how important this event was to the guy, to these guys and how serious they was about it. But we've proven that they missed it by 40 years. But look what it was they were that they should have been looking at and look when they should have been looking for it. You see right here in this verse right here, he says in 1884, he began to give us his teachings, the third testament of the Bible. That's what this document is that you're looking at here. It, this is the third testament of the Bible. If I can ever get back up to the beginning of it. This is the third part to the scripture. Just like back there when our father came down and talked with Moses there, he left them with a document. The, he left them with the covenant, a new set of doctrine for those people to live their lives by, to learn to live within the law, to learn to stop stealing and killing from each other and to stop um, um, sleeping with each other's wives and stop, you know, all this stuff that mankind was doing up until that point he gave them a set of documents to live by to teach them how to live their life well the same thing happened when the messiah came when we entered what we call the piscean age and humanity was once again changing we got a new set of documents that taught us how to love each other how to love the father as our, uh, uh, with all how to love the father with all of our, our heart and our mind and to love our brother as ourself so whereas the first Testament, which we call the Old Testament, gave us the law and taught us how to live within the law. The Second Testament taught us how to live in love, how to love one another. And here we have the Third Testament teaching us how to live in the spirit or how to live in the light. If you want to keep them all in L words, you had the law, then the love and now the light which this light we're talking about is the spiritual enlightenment, this phase that humanity is about to go in now. Some of you have heard of the great awakening where our spirit is exalted to a higher level of understanding. Well, it is through this document, whether you receive it physically by way of this book right here that you can print out or whether you receive it intuitively, um, you, we are still getting this document and this doctrine right here for us to live by in this new era. This is our new set of documents, this new set of doctrine that we are receiving to go into what we call the kingdom age. The kingdom of heaven is, is where we will actually use this stuff. It's talking about spirituality. It's talking about spirit to spirit communication. It's talking about, you know, how we will actually use telekinesis. It's talking about how we would use telepathy. It's, I'm serious, guys. It tells us, you know, how to take advantage of our spiritual power. You, you remember the Christ. When Jesus was walking around uh, those 2,000 years ago, he was uh, doing all of these things that humanity called miracles. You know, they, he, was, uh, he, he changed the weather at one point. He healed the sick. He gave the blind their, their sight. He changed water into wine. He did all kinds of stuff. But in the scripture, we're told that he was an example and that we too had those same powers. Weren't we? We were told that we could heal the sick. He even gave it to us as a command to heal the sick and to raise the dead. But who's ever been able to do that? Well, it is through the doctrine of this third 
uh, Testament that we are actually learning how to be like Christ, have those same powers. We can now control the weather. You know, we, 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 I'm sitting right here now at the end of Hurricane Sally. Hurricane Sally came through and blew all kinds of stuff, caused a lot of damage. I'm not sure we're, we're out of power right now and I'm not sure how much damage is caused, but you know, through the power of prayer, the only thing it did to our little homestead was knocked over one cherry tree as far as I'm concerned. But you know, it, it, it's because of that power to, to, to pray against those elements and against those forces that would otherwise destroy our homes or destroy our lives. We learn this through this third Testament of the Bible. And we see here that it actually came down. We actually started receiving the teachings in 1884. This video is brought to you by the Celestial Clock Calendar, the official timepiece of the 144,000. Get your Celestial Clock Calendar at coachinafight.shop or follow the links in the description below. Now, when you look up a little earlier in the verse right there, you see that it says the year 1886, this was when his spirit first came down and started talking to um, who would have then been the John the Baptist of this era. You know, the Elijah spirit always comes first. It came in the form of John the Baptist when the, before the, the Messiah came. Well, it came in this, in the form of this figure named Ro, Rogis in this era where you had the indwelling of the Elijah spirit that came down and talked to this Ro, Rogis individual and got him uh, building this community. Well, it was certain members who embraced the teachings of Ro, Rogis that went on to actually transcribe or to, to uh, pin the, the the doctrine that was coming from the Christ, which is the third testament of the Bible. But you look at when he when it says he came down there, it says on the first of September in 1866. Well, you have to understand the translation error being made here because our father, he doesn't use words like September and October. Those are Gregorian calendar months. Those are pagan months on a pagan calendar. But if you know anything about Latin or Greek, you know that that um, root of that word September means seven, just like OCT in October means eight, just like NOV in November means nine and DEC in December means 10. SEPT means seven. What this is saying right here is on the Rosh Hashanah, 1886 was when we had the return of Christ. Hence the title of this video that the Christ returned on Rosh Hashanah. That's when he returned in Rosh Hashanah. So you say, well, what's the big deal? You know, why, why, why? Okay. This was back there in 1866 or 1884. Why are we talking about it now? Well, number of reasons. First of all, so we can take advantage of it. Understand, you know, this is the third Testament of the Bible. Some of you are the first, this is the first time you're actually hearing about the third Testament of the Bible. Well, you can find a link to it in the description of this video. You can find both a PDF that you could download to your com to your device, to your computer. We're going into some hard times and you're going to want to have, you know, several copies of this book. You want to have at least one. And two, you understand where the father dwells. You know, where, did, where is he at? People are still looking for the return of Christ right now, even though we seem to be in the tribulation. You, you know, you got people who are looking for him. Well, when you understand this third testament, you understand that he actually dwells dwells in our heart. He dwells in our spirit. That thing that people be calling the Holy Spirit or the Elijah spirit, they be talking about they got the Holy Ghost this and the Holy Ghost that, that what they have is the spirit of God dwelling in him. That's, they can actually, we can actually communicate with him spirit to spirit. We can actually hear his voice, feel his guidance. We can actually feel him taking care of us from the inside. Once we understand that, you know, that is God in there. That is our father in our conscience that is speaking to us. That's where he speaks to us from. It's inside of our conscience. So that's, that's, those are the reasons why we want this information. But like we said, we still got several people, religious people, ministers, uh, reverend, pastors, deacons, doctors. They're all still looking for the return of Christ. Well, think about it. That's the same way it was back there with the Messiah. Mary, Jesus's mother, 
He, she knew who Jesus was. John the Baptist knew who Jesus was. There was a bunch of people all throughout the Messiah's life knew that he was the Christ. They knew that he was God made flesh. They even knew that back in the Old Testament. But did the average guy know it? Did the Pharisees know it and the Sadducees know it? They were the last ones to find out. The religious leaders of the day, they didn't find out that he was God made flesh, that he was the word walking around until after they killed him. Well, that's exactly what you got going on today, where there are people still looking for the Christ even today. Even though, you know, Herod, the king, he knew who he was. You know, a bunch of people knew it's the common man that didn't know who Christ was back then. And it is the common man, I'm sorry to say it, that don't know who Christ is today. Well, we can find this document and we can know who he is. Like I said, there's links in the description. There's that PDF. There's also an audio book in there um, coming from a channel on YouTube that actually read this entire book in about 67 chapters over there on, uh, YouTube. You can even download that if you want help, uh, on how to download that and turn it into an MP3 that you can, you know, put on your phone and walk around with, even when the internet is turned off, let me know. I can help you do that. But this book is highly suppressed. There's a lot of people that don't want you to know about this book. Just like back then. You remember Herod? He wanted to kill the Messiah. Well, the governments of the day, this new world order doesn't want you to know about this book because it threatens the new economy, this new world government. I mean... It, it, it threatens, I mean, think about it. Back there in 1884, all of those people were quitting their jobs. That's what the government is afraid you're going to do if you actually find out about this book. And then the religions of the world, they don't want you to know about this book either because it puts in, it puts in jeopardy their religious standings. I mean, it, you remember in the, in the New Testament, it says that they're as part of the new covenant. Like you're reading over here in Hebrews in chapter eight, when it talks about the new covenant there that will come down where the laws will be written on our heart. You look right there in verse 11, what it says, and they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord for all shall know me from the least unto the greatest. This is why they don't want us to understand this, this, um, this third, this third Testament doctrine. This is why they don't want us to un un This is why they don't want us to understand spirituality because it puts their religious standings in jeopardy. I mean, you see right there where it says that, you know, once we become spiritual individuals, once we enter this third this once we enter this new covenant, you're not going to need religious teachers anymore. You, that's what it's, that's what verse 11 is saying. You, you're not going to have some preacher to tell you to love the Lord. You're going to know him for yourself. And this is one of the reasons, if not the main reason, why our uh, religious leaders of today don't want us to embrace the doctrine of this book. They don't want to lose all, you know, that their million dollar jets and their hundred thousand dollar cars and, you know, their million dollar houses is at stake here if these people understand and this third testament of the bible but you have the people that are still looking for him you know it kind of reminds me of uh, my kids you know i have seven children and you know they all have different levels of understanding when it comes to just about everything in life well let me use them guys as an analogy to help you understand what's going on here and you know how there are a lot of people who understand that the Christ has returned and they're taking advantage of it while you have many people that are still looking for him even till today well you know i use this analogy you know me being daddy i leave the house and i tell my seven kids to don't make a mess when I'm gone, okay? So I'm gone for a while, and of course they out there partying, they doing everything they can, swinging from the chandelier, jumping on the bed, you know, some of them are in the refrigerator eating stuff they ain't supposed to be eating. Some of them are over there associating with people they're not supposed to be associating. Some people are watching stuff on television that they know they would get in trouble for if I was still here. That I'm gone and these kids are just wilding out. Well, that's us. Well, out of this group, you got one smart kid, one really, really smart one out of the bunch. And he looks at the clock. He looks at the time and he said, you know, this is the time when daddy told us he was going to be back. 
And so what does he do? He gets his stuff straight. He's over there somewhere reading in a book, sitting down quietly reading. And then you got the wise one. Now, the wise one, she didn't saw this smart guy. She didn't saw this guy go over there and sit down somewhere and clean. And she's like, you know what? I'm going to clean up too. So she didn't sat, she didn't start cleaning up and she's somewhere getting ready to get settled. Well, then you have the observant children. They didn't saw, you know, some of the individuals stopped partying. They didn't started looking down the driveway to see the car come into the yard. Sure enough, here it comes. They didn't settle down too. They didn't got in a position where they starting to clean up and starting to get ready for a daddy to come. But then you got them other kids. The mother ones that ain't paying attention to nothing. They still jumping on the bed. They still swinging from the sandaliers when the door opened. And there is daddy standing there with a belt. Well, that's the time when we're living in, guys. We're in this observant period where you have a lot of people who are taking on the feast days and remembering the laws given over there in the book of the covenant. And they're actually trying to get right with the Lord. While you got these other ones, they're still wilding out. Guess who's going to get the whooping? I'll give you one guess who's going to catch the beating first. That one that's sitting over there reading, he probably ain't going to get no beating at all. You know? But them ones that's still jumping on the bed, still you know got their area still you know got the television on something they ain't supposed to be watching and daddy's sitting there looking at them they gonna catch a beating first all right so i hope you understand that analogy because that's exactly where we're at right now i'm gonna go ahead and get ready to close this video out um look for those uh other videos that i promised you gonna be showing you more detail on these subjects here this is very serious business you guys go ahead and leave a comment down below I was trying to think of a code word that we could use so that we can identify those people that actually watched the entire video, not a troll that, you know, clicked on a video based on the title and jumped down there and put some blurb down there in the comment section. Having not watched the video at all, there were naysayers said, you know, you guys don't know what you're talking about. Use the word power in your comment. Put the, I don't care how you use it. You can end it with it. You can start it with it. You can use it as a sentence. But the word power in your comment lets everybody know that you are at least watched the video and you at least heard the message and you at least have an educated um, uh, comment. It's not just a troll comment. It's not based on, you know, your thoughts, feelings and beliefs before you started this video. But you actually went through the entire video. So just use the word power down there somewhere. All right, so I'm going to close this out. Remember to look for the links to the Third Testament of the Bible in the description of this video. And if you got something out of this video, go ahead and hit the like button. If you didn't get anything out of this video or if you disagree with what we're saying, you know, go ahead and hit the dislike button. But, you know, leave us a comment either way. Leave us a powerful comment either way. Godspeed and Shalom.